Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait for a few more people to sign up. Um, so we'll probably go live just in a couple of minutes or maybe maybe at 14.32. So good afternoon again. My name is Laura. Um, so myself, Kate and Mike are going to be, Kate Davis and Mike are going to be presenting our final webinar for the autumn series. This one's on the risk of falls in lower limb amputees. And on the panel, we also have Denise Arthay. So she's um, one of our amputee demonstrators. So we're delighted to have her on board today. And then Joe and Kate, as usual, uh, for our panellists and they'll be able to answer any questions that you may have. So during the uh, webinar, everybody is on mute um, and I don't think that you're able to unmute yourself. Um, Big Brother is in control. Um, the webinar is being recorded and if you do have any questions, uh, we will answer all the questions at the end. So after Denise has given us a bit of a an insight into her, her experiences, but at any point you can use the chat facility to ask your question. So you don't need to wait until the end before you before you ask the question, just add it as, as it comes into your head. And there are some handouts, there's three handouts on the side, so two white papers, one is on um, the Avalon foot in specific, and then one is more generally on hydraulic ankles. And then there's a, a falls um, handout as well. So if you do have any questions, then feel free to, to use the chat, as I said, or um, you can also email me and I can answer the question myself, or if I can't, I'll direct you to the person who can. So today we're going to run through, it's the same format for anyone who's been on, on one of these webinars before. We'll have a bit of an overview on amputee biomechanics, so kind of specifically looking at reasons for falling, um, biomechanical reasons for falling, and then review the literature, and then we'll lead on to some of the prosthetic solutions and discuss the clinical evidence for the, the Blatchford technology, so the solutions that we have. Then we'll hear from Denise, and then we'll take any questions or have any discussion. So I'm going to hand over to Kate Davies now, who's going to talk through 
um, a bit about the biomechanics and review the literature. Cool, thanks Laura. Uh, hi guys, so we decided to mix it up a little bit today, so in an exciting turn of events, me and Mike have swapped, and so I'm going to start us off. Um, as ever in these webinars, we want to focus on clinical evidence. And as we've mentioned previously, clinical evidence is used to demonstrate many things, but where they all interlink is ensuring the long-term health of the user. Of the four key secondary conditions there are, that are common amongst the amputee population, today we're going to fo focus on the risk of falls. So as Laura mentioned, the first thing we're going to consider is amputee biomechanics. Before we can understand the effects of amputee biomechan biomechanics, we must first understand how healthy biomechanics works. Then we'll compare these to see how amputee gait differs, what adaptions may be made to accommodate these differences, and what issues are likely to arise as a consequence. To help us look at the different mechanisms that lead to falls and to address them, we've categorized the different factors that can affect the likelihood of a fall occurring. These are the balance and stability of the user, the occurrence of trips or catching toes, and then what we've classed as community falls. So this covers other factors such as navigating obstacles, stairs, or complex movement that happen during daily activities. So here I've stolen some of Mike's wonderful animations to help illustrate. Um, so when we look at the balance and stability of an individual when standing on different surfaces, we can see the difference between a prosthesis user and an able-bodied person. For, healthy, for a healthy, able-bodied individual with no major injury, no matter what the terrain or gradient is doing, the ground reaction force remains equal between the limbs. It might change position a little bit, so forwards or backwards, but generally the loading remains pretty balanced. For a prosthesis user, when standing on level ground, slightly more weight is taken through the sound limb, but loading is still quite balanced. However, when we look at slope standing, using a standard prosthetic foot with minimal adaption, the forces can be quite different. So when standing downhill, in order to get the foot flat, the knee has to flex more. So with transtibial patients, this is the anatomical knee and it puts extra st strain through the knee. And with transfemorals, it means that the ground reaction force moves posterior to the knee joint center. And so the prosthetic knee is more prone to buckling. This means they can't put as much weight on the knee, and so they have a dependency on the sound limb. Alternatively, quite often the toe of the prosthetic foot is lifted, and so they rest on the heel, which can be unstable. Because of the instability, they then hyperextend the knee and flex the hip to stabilize, meaning that the back is then arched and we have, um, we have issues. When standing uphill, the same thing occurs. So the knee has to lock back um, in hyperextension, and they're constantly fighting the toe spring of the foot. In both situations here, the loading on the limbs is unbalanced. This introduces an instability, and we end up seeing a lot more corrective movement in the individual as they try to stay balanced. This is called postural sway, and can be a good indicator for stability and balance of an individual. So stability is also important for dynamic alignment. In able-bodied gait, through stance phase, the muscles work to stabilize the knee and the ankle, providing a strong foundation during weight acceptance, then a smooth rollover, contracting at the right time at the end of stance phase to produce propulsion and transfer the weight to the other limb, lifting the foot ready for swing. When we consider this for an amputee, at heel strike, we want the foot to plantar flex to foot, um, to foot flat for balance and the need to provide stability by staying in extension through the weight bearing period to avoid buckling. We then need the ankle to dorsiflex for a smooth rollover and then plantar flex to produce some kind of propulsion. The knee flexing at the right time to lift the leg ready for swing. In healthy swing phase, as the limb then swings through, the anatomical knee flexes to bring the leg through and the ankle dorsiflexes so, so that the toes lift off boot lift off the ground away out of the way instead of drooping down and dragging along the floor. During prosthetic swing phase, even if the knee timing is correct, standard prosthetic feet do not actively dorsiflex. This means that the toe clearance, um, that is the space between the end of the toe and the ground, is less, 
And so the foot is more likely to catch or scuff on the ground, causing a trip and very possibly a fall. So whether consciously or not, if a prosthesis user consistently catches their toe, the body begins to compensate, usually with a gait deviation. The most common in this instance are shown here. The first is hip hiking, where the prosthetic side hip is lifted up and over in order for the leg to be lifted higher. The second is vaulting, where the sound side foot lifts up onto the toe in order to create more space from the ground to the end of the prosthetic leg. The third is circumduction, and this is where the prosthetic side is swung laterally around instead of straight through. All of these compensations can not only cause imbalances in the body that lead to secondary conditions, as we saw last week, but they also increase postural sway. And so although they may prevent the individual from tripping, they may still cause a fall through loss of balance or instability. So our third category encompasses a range of different activities that require complex movements, such as sit to stand, stand to sit, and stair ambulation, all of which require stability and balance. The ability for an individual to complete these activities can of course be affected by other factors too. So age and comorbidities can have dramatic effects on mobility and strength, which can mean the leg isn't lifted up properly during gait, increasing the risk of tripping. In addition, some medications can impair cognitive function or muscle control, affecting the individual's balance. So with all of that in mind, I'm gonna just quickly talk through some what the scientific evidence exists around falls. So when we look at the research, we have to split this discussion up into four different sections. Firstly, we've got the prevalence. So this is the rate at which falls occur in different populations. Then we've got what factors affect falls, so the causes. Um, then we move on to what the consequences are of falling and from there into the financial implications um, that occur from a fall. So firstly, prevalence. How often are falls happening? Now, usually studies focus on a specific time frame. These particular figures look at the percentage of each population who experienced a fall over a 12 month period. If we look at the able-bodied population, which is in green, falls occur in about 25 to 35% of the participants. So not surprisingly, the majority of the literature on able-bodied falls focuses on the elderly population. So this figure is perhaps a little higher um, than if a more general view was taken. In stark contrast, however, it's been estimated that between 50 to 58% of lower limb amputees experience at least one fall in a year. This can be divided into transtibial participants at 43 to 53% and transfemoral amputees at a staggering 64%. So that means in general, at least half of, lower limb amputee, of the lower limb amputee population fall at least once a year. So it's quite clear that there is an issue here that needs to be resolved. So when we look at what causes falls, it helps to get a rough baseline from an able-bodied population. The results are perhaps a little bit predictable and conveniently, they seem to match our categories, which of course is a brilliant stroke of luck and by no means planned. Um, this study investigated falls in the elderly able-bodied population. So again, it is a little bit skewed but they found that 328 participants experienced at least one fall over a 12 month period, with some experiences experiencing multiple falls. The majority of falls occurred because of either loss of balance or tripping, and falls that caused by a trip were more likely to cause injury. Other falls happened because of factors such as slipping, stairs or obstacle navigation, and some weren't specified. The pie charts here show the breakdown of the causes of falls that resulted in either mild injuries like bruising or sprains and more severe injuries such as broken bones. Oddly enough, the distribution for both of those was roughly the same, but again, in both cases, trips were the number one cause. What I find quite interesting about this study is that out of the 1,172 falls that were recorded, 783 of those, so about 70%, actually occurred inside the home, mostly in the bathroom, um, and not outside as you'd expect where there are more things to navigate. So from this, we've got a few different um, causes that we want to focus on. So firstly, loss of balance. Now, when we look at the population of lower limb amputees, we of course have to 
consider a much larger age range with more diversity and strength and balance, but there are specific confounding factors that affect everyone. Firstly, because part of the leg is missing, the torso and upper body make up the majority of the weight, and so lower limb amputees have a higher centre of mass. This inherently makes them more unsteady. Secondly, because of the missing limb, the base of support rests on one foot and so is a lot narrower. This can of course be improved with a prosthetic limb and correct alignment, but generally the individual still relies heavily on the sound side. And thirdly, because of this uneven loading and the loss of proprioception that comes with amputation, individuals will usually display more postural sway which is, as we know, is indicative of poor balance. So the previous study on able-bodied participants also showed that trips accounted for the majority of falls. This is, confound is confounded by an amputation as well. Again, because of the loss of proprioception, but also um, because of the reduced ability to recover and get the limb back underneath the body to prevent a fall once a trip has occurred. Therefore, it's better to prevent the trip from happening in the first place. A study looked at the causes of falls in lower limb amputees. They recorded which participants fell and then compared different factors to those who didn't. The outstanding result um, when doing this comparison was the toe clearance provided by the prosthetic feet. Non-fallers clocked in at around an average of 25.6 millimeters, whereas the individuals that did fall only averaged half of that at 12.3. From this, we know that toe clearance provided by the prosthetic limb can have a huge effect on whether a fall will occur. Now, looking at the um, other causes, I've already said there are a lot of confounding factors that, which can lead to falls. And quite a lot of these also present in able-bodied individuals, particularly musculoskeletal problems that cause pain. But within the amputee population, they are generally more common. I won't read them all out, um, but they just serve to show how variable the causes can be with perhaps some factors that wouldn't be immediately obvious. So now we've looked at the co what causes falls, we have to look on the other side to after the fall has happened. Firstly, we'll look at how the individual is impacted. In general, 50% of lower limb amputees will fall, who fall sustain a soft tissue injury so bruising or a sprain of varying severity, while only 7% sustain a bone injury that requires hospital treatment. Now, this might sound like a good figure, only 7%, great, and absolutely it is. However, it's very easy to disregard soft tissue injury as not serious, when in fact, injury to a ligament, tendon or muscle can actually take longer and require much more rehabilitation to heal compared to a broken bone. In the previous slide, we saw that pain can be an influencing factor of falling, and so a non-serious injury, if not treated properly, can actually lead to a further fall. In addition to this, 49% of amputees report a fear of falling, and 60% report that their confidence was affected by a fall. So both of these factors will only serve to make the individual even less, even more or less steady on their feet as they unconsciously change their gait to try and balance or to prevent pain. This lack of confidence can also lead to limitation of their activities and very quickly their level of independence drops and so does their participation. Now, as we all now know, extended isolation is not at all great for one's well-being, um, and these things can only affect, um, can affect how well the patients get on with their prosthesis as well. The cumulative result of the lack of confidence, loss of independence and potential pain all have drastic effects on their quality of life. Another consequence of falling is the subsequent cost. This can be divided into direct and indirect cost. Direct cost is the cost of medical treatment as a result of the fall, whereas indirect cost is the cost to the individual. So that's not um, that doesn't mean it's directly linked to their medical care. So this could include public, getting public transport that they have to take to and from appointments, or even the fact that because of their injury or reduction in confidence, they're unable to work and so then they lose money. It's estimated that in America, to treat a transfemoral amputee for six months following a fall, the average cost is just over $25,500 
but this can be as, as high as nearly $39,000. If we narrow this down to only individuals that were admitted to the emergency department, the average is around $18,000. The lower cost here is, like, is likely because this category also includes many falls that result in fatality. In these cases, as not much treatment is required, the figure is lower. However, some admittals to the emergency department reached $57,000. Looking at the general population, over a, year, over a year in the US, the cost of falls that resulted in a fatality um, was $638 million. For non-fatal falls, the direct cost to medical services was $31 billion, and indirect costs reached $18 billion. Out of all the injuries sustained from falls, again over the general population, fractures made up 35%, but they accounted for 61% of the medical costs. So, <laughs> now I've set the scene and thoroughly depressed us all with doom and gloom. Um, I'm going to hand over to Laura, who's hopefully going to cheer us up a little bit and talk through some of the prosthetic technologies that can help. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. I might just, um, I'm just picturing my gin and tonic now when I get home to console myself with the likelihood of me falling in the future. Um, however, for amputees, we're going to go back to looking at our subcategories and these you know the balance and stability tripping and other other activities so community falls and we'll now look at how technology can improve these features so improve balance improve stability and reduce the likelihood of trips and falls so we've got a few products to just um, highlight today and the first is uh, the kx06 knee which is a polycentric knee joint and therefore provides increased stability due to the geometry of the knee, so it being a four bar polycentric knee, when compared to a single axis knee for the same activity group. So a direct comparison in, in the Blatchford catalogue, if you want to say, it would be the KX06 against the Mercury knee. And one of the one of the main features is that instantaneous centre of rotation stays high. So we know that because of the four bar nature, therefore increasing stability. And we also know that this um, instantaneous centre of rotation changes throughout the arc of knee flexion, thereby making it easier to initiate swing and clear the ground. And the design of the knee was tested on primarily on military personnel to, to start with, who certainly put it through its paces, especially for other activities. So you can see in the video at the bottom um, that there's there's stability in standing when the when the amputee is cycling. And that is really just by the, the design of the knee. So the, the amputee in question feels that he's got way more control with the four bar knee than what he had with his previous knee. And it also shows um, the user paddle boarding, a different person paddle boarding, where we can lock the knee in extension. So this isn't, I suppose it's not specific to the KX06, but it does mean that balancing is easier. And in this particular case, means that the knee remains waterproof. And if we look at walking with a polycentric knee, then we can see at loading response, the ground reaction force passes um, in front of the knee centre, so we have stability. However, compared to this, to the Mercury or to a single axis knee, there's more stability because the centre of rotation is more posterior and proximal. And then this remains stable throughout early stance until we get past mid stance, where the vector then passes behind the knee centre, enabling knee flexion. So the benefit here is that the centre of rotation then shifts and lowers going into swing. So if we see during swing, we can not only fine tune the resistance to knee flexion or effectively to heel rise to suit the individual, but also we can see that the lower centre of lowered centre of rotation helps to increase the ground, ground clearance compared to a single axis knee, therefore reducing the risk of the foot catching during swing extension. And then with the knee reaching extension, the centre of rotation goes back to its higher position, therefore giving stability for the next heel strike. And if we move on to feet, we know that Blatchford um, hydraulic ankles have been proven to have multiple benefits 
And in this case, we can see the videos at the top. Again, these are the same videos that if anyone was on the last uh, webinar, they're the same videos, unfortunately. Um, you'll be sick to the death of them. But we can see this that the ankle self align is determining determine on where the body is relative to the ankle pivot point. So the, the user is very much in control of the movement at the ankle. And at the top, um, although the, the user at the front, so he's the one with the hydraulic ankle, although he's statically standing on a slope, you can hopefully still see the rotation at the ankle when the body position adjusts. So this means that the foot is also in a better position for swing, which we'll discuss um, later on. And for lower activity amputees um, or in the elderly population, this is even more essential to avoid tripping. So I'm not saying that anyone who is elderly, obviously we all have a different opinion on what elderly means, but I'm not saying that every 85, 90 year old amputee will be inactive and will be likely to fall. There's obviously exceptions, but generally we know that increasing age can often mean that there's a reduction in muscle power and therefore more changes in gait. So for walking, it's been shown, if you look at um, the Avalon foot, so this has been designed specifically for this K2 or this lower activity amputee population or indeed the elderly population. And for walking, it's been shown that symmetry improves with the addition of the hydraulic ankle. So, so in the same, given the same keel, so as in the lower part of the foot was kept the same, um, the study found that with a hydraulic ankle, symmetry improved. And while this alone doesn't directly imply that there's a reduction in the risk of falls, it does suggest that there's more stand stability. The Avalon foot uses a three quarter length keel. So rather than a full length um, keel in our other hydraulic ankles, therefore there is less resistance at the toe to start with, um, which is which we don't need the same amount of resistance because of the lower activity. And there's also more range of dorsiflexion compared to the echelon, making it ideal for the elderly amputee in terms of clearing the ground. And this also helps in other activities such as picking items off the ground and going from sit to stand. So if we move on to walking with a hydraulic ankle, because the foot stays in a dorsiflex position going into swing and indeed throughout the whole swing phase, we can minimise potential gait compensations during swing because of the increased minimum toe clearance, especially at mid swing. Therefore, there's less chance of a trip or a fall recurring to begin with. And when we introduce a microprocessor, I need to slow down, the, I'm talking quicker than the um, software is moving. When we introduce a microprocessor as we did with the LAN, this means that the user has even more stability for standing due to the foot, um, the foot maximizing the resistance to plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So this is, um, we've, we've talked about this on the previous webinar, but this is especially useful for bilateral amputees, whereby if they don't have the standing mode, then they will typically tend to find the end range of dorsiflexion and use that as a, as a stop so that they then stand in a kind of more crouched skate. Whereas with the standing mode, uh, there were different users were definitely able to stand more upright and felt that they had more control. And we have the same increased ground clearance with the LAN as we talked about with the echelon. And if we move now on to looking at another knee joint, so specifically the Orion 3, we can provide stability over, over a variety of situations so for standing, there's an IMU in the knee which is able to determine whether the amputee is moving or whether they're stationary. And if they're stationary, the knee will provide an increased resistance. To knee. So this is regardless of whether the, the knee joint, the prosthetic knee joint, is extended or flexed. As soon as there's no movement, the resistance ramps up and then the amputee can stand with the full support on the equally, so between the, the prosthetic side and the intact side. 
And then for walking, the Orion has a high level of stand stability with the knee remaining in this high stand stability until leap swing, whereby when the knee is extended and there's enough load in the toe, it will drop to a lower resistance for ease of swing initi initiation. And this is particularly important during stumble recovery, which we'll come on to in just a second. And we need to also think about other activities. So Denise will hopefully touch on a few of these. But when walking down slopes or stairs, or indeed for sitting, the, the user will also benefit from the yield resistance, which effectively gives controlled knee flexion on the prosthetic side, allowing a timed contact on the intact side. So we're going to look a little bit more closely at the, the stumble part of the video. And you can see in this video here that Becky, so that's the, the person in the video, she's able to catch herself after stumbling. And this is because the knee is already in a high stance resistance during swing. So it's already got that high resistance ready for the next heel strike. And after detecting an abnormal step, so in other words, the, the knee starts to flex again during extension, then this preset high resistance is ramped up to an even higher resistance, which gives Becky time to get her left leg on the ground. In other, other knees, or if Becky had another type of knee, this would be unlikely to happen, and she would probably have fallen forward, or at least had to make more adjustments to, to control the stability. So we've got our little... Um, magic mic graphics again um, and in this slide we see the same three static loading scenarios again so facing downhill level ground and then facing uphill and for all three um, many situations the hydraulic ankle is on the left and it really mimics what you saw earlier with the normal gait situation so you can see that the hip the knee and the ankle are in alignment on the left picture when facing downhill and the left of the pictures facing uphill whereas this isn't the case it's, sorry, it's not the case in the fixed ankle scenarios which are to the right of it so in level ground we wouldn't necessarily expect to see visually to see much in the way of biomechanical adaptation with and without a hydraulic ankle because the, the ground is level and we do our bench alignment to have this sort of natural standing geometric stability. However, from experience of fitting countless lines over the past few years, and especially um, yeah, probably the last like three or four with the microprocessor knee policy, the feedback from the end user is that they can stand more comfortably with the standing mode of the Orion on, and therefore they feel more stable over over a prolonged period. And again, if we look at just a caption of, of what the MPK does when a trip occurs, so moving on to the next slide, the main point here is to, to show again what happens if the toe catches on the ground. So we see at the point of sort of mid swing, the, on the third, third picture from the left, then the toes caught the ground and that's where we're likely to have the, the trip or a stumble. And then at this point, the knee flexion resistance detects that, that that's the abnormal part of the step. And it ramps up the resistance to provide support and therefore reduce the chance of the fall, as you saw in the video with Becky. So if we move now, so we've looked at balance um, and stability. We've looked at walking um, and, and tripping. And now we're going to have a quick look at the other activities. And a key activity really here is going from, sit, from sitting to standing or vice versa. So we can see that the increase, if we look at just sit to stand, the increased dorsiflexion range from the ankle, so whether that's the echelon or, or the avalon that has the increased range, this allows the, the body centre of mass to come over the base of support, meaning that there's less demand on the joints when going from sitting to standing. And if we go the other way from standing to sitting, we know that yielding knees pr provide, or yielding knees that do provide resistance to knee flexion um, are great for sitting down because they do give extra support. And this means that with the Orion 3, the, the user can load both legs equally and therefore be more balanced when sitting. And the Orion takes this step, takes this one step further 
by providing a proportional resistance depending on the knee flexion angle. So in the same way, if you imagine, um, and you could do it now if you particularly wanted, if you if you were doing a squat or you were standing with your knees slightly bent, then your muscles, and particularly your quadriceps muscles, would be controlling that. And if you then did a larger squat, so as Joe Wicks calls them a sumo squat, if you did a sumo squat, then your muscles have to fire much more to control that new position because there's a massive knee flexion moment happening, obviously. So in the same way that our knee extensor muscles are controlling the rate of knee flexion and work harder at larger flexion angles, the resistance from the Orion also ramps up as the angle of flexion increases. And this is particularly of a benefit when descending stairs because there obviously isn't a chair to break the fall. So in a standard using knee, what you sometimes see is this premature ground contact on the, on the next step on the intact limb as the, the yield effectively or the knee effectively runs out of resistance. So meaning that there's increased load through the joints, but also that that's where there's more likely to be a trip or a fall. But the enhanced yield on the Orion again means that the knee flexion on the prosthetic side is controlled for longer, meaning that there's more stability from the prosthesis. So that's a quick whistle stop tour of some of the um, technology that we have, which has been designed to mitigate the chances of trips and falling occurring. And I'm now going to hand you over to Mike, who's going to go through some of the clinical clinical evidence for these technologies. Thanks, Laura. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so as Laura says, uh, I'm going to discuss some of the evidence that's uh, available for these different technologies that uh, she's just discussed. Um, I'm also going to follow the same pattern as the other two, um, in that we'll start off by talking about stability uh, and balance. Um, so this this relates to things that both Kate and Laura have talked about today. Um, the first is postural sway, which is what is being measured in this particular study. Um, but there's a lot going on, so I'll I'll talk you through um, from left to right. So this is this is a study looking at transfemoral amputees standing facing down a slope. So as Laura mentioned, this was uh, a, a particular situation that affects um, effectively changes the alignment um, of the limb uh, during standing and can, can create balance issues. Uh, if we look at the far left hand side, you can see that there's um, a fixed ankle uh, and this particular microprocessor knee has the standing mode turned off. Uh, the next one in from the left, the second one along, that's got a fixed ankle but with the standing mode turned on. Uh, this is nicely set, but with the standing mode off. And then the fourth one is using a hydraulic ankle with the microprocessor knee standing mode switched on. Um, and you can see, if you look at the, the numbers underneath, that is a, uh, a the mean postural sway measurement that was taken uh, in this study. So you can see from left to right, they gradually get smaller and a smaller value indicates less sway, which indicates a better balance. Um, on the far right hand side as well, I've uh, included the, the value for able-bodied um, participants, control participants. And you can see that the, the closest uh, prosthetic setup to get uh, well, the closest to the able-bodied number um, was the combination of MPK standing mode with a hydraulic ankle because it allows the limb to be aligned uh, with a good posture and then provides that extra support uh, from the standing mode. I should uh, say as well in this particular study there was not a significant difference between the uh, that particular prosthetic setup and the able-bodied uh, control values. Uh, next, we'll move on to um, tripping. Um, so th there's a lot going on again on this slide. Um, so I'm, I'll do it one by one. Looking in the middle, first of all, uh, this is walking on level ground. Um, and you can see a comparison between a fixed ankle uh, shown on the red bar and a hydraulic ankle shown on the blue bar. And the, the measurement we're showing here is the minimum toe clearance. This is the distance between the ground and the end of the foot during swing phase and the minimum value. So it's the the point at which you're most likely to catch your foot and trip. Uh, and you can see there that there's um, a, an 18% increase when using the hydraulic ankle. Uh, this particular study 
um, only looked at these two types of feet, um, but we can expect a microprocessor foot, such as a lamb, like uh, Laura was talking about, um, to behave in the same way as the hydraulic ankle uh, when walking on level ground at a self-selected speed. Um, there are different conditions, obviously, uh, when you're walking downhill. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see that, the, again, the fixed ankle is the worst performer on the red bar, um, and the hydraulic in blue and the microprocessor foot in green are approximately equivalent when walking downhill in terms of clearance, but both the hydraulic feet have uh, a greater performance than the fixed foot, increasing that toe clearance and reducing the likelihood of a fall, uh, trip and then a fall. Um, on the far right hand side, you can see walking uphill, there's actually a step increase going on here. So while hydraulic ankles uh, show an improvement compared to fixed, that's the blue over the red, um, you get an extra increase with the microprocessor foot compared to the hydraulic ankle. So this time your land would perform better than your echelon uh, in terms of increasing that clearance during uh, walking. And obviously as the ground is tilting upwards, uh, the chance of catching your foot is is even greater. This uh, particular study did something really interesting. Actually, they um, they just they took that measurement and then tried to build a model to predict the probability of falling with each of these feet based on those measurements. So if we look at the graph in the middle, you can see the different lines for each of the feet. So red for fixed, blue for hydraulic, and green for microprocessor. And the the dotted uh, vertical gray line um, is indicating an object that might be on the floor um, of that is 15 millimeters high and then where that dotted line crosses each of the curves indicates the probability of somebody walking with that foot uh, to hit that object and trip so if we look on the left hand side the bar chart there shows that it's what, about a 29 percent chance of uh, tripping on a 50 millimeter high object with a fixed foot when you're walking downhill, that reduces to about 8%, I think it is, for the hydraulic ankle. And actually the, the median value uh, of probability of tripping for the um, for the microprocessor foot here was was actually 0%. There was, there was a range, um, you know, there was an upper and a lower range, but the median value, the middle one was uh, zero. When we look at the, um, the right hand side you can see walking uphill the same same thing being shown on the graph here the chances of tripping on a 15 millimeter high object um this is obviously increased because it's, you've not only got the object now but also the ground is tilting upwards um so for the fixed foot it's about 45 percent with the median value hydraulic ankle greatly reduced it comparatively uh to again around eight nine percent but then further the the adaptation of the microprocessor foot helped to uh reduce that probability even further um, and so that that foot performed the best um, in terms of the probability of tripping when walking uphill. Uh, to take a slightly different tack now um, on the next slide if it comes up there we go uh, this is a, a knee joint instead of an ankle joint and this is um, the ground clearance measured using polycentric knees so this particular study uh, built a simulator so they they put knees on uh, setup, lifted them and then dropped them and would see how how the uh, the different uh, knees that they were comparing varied in terms of uh, ground clearance. Uh, within this study, there was 11 polycentric knees tested, uh, one of which was KX06. Um, there was also one mechanical monocentric knee and one MPK, uh, which was also monocentric. Uh, as you can see on the graph there, um, they're of increasing swing clearance from left to right, and the KX06 performed really quite well um, compared to all the different knees. I think if you can see that most of the monocentric uh, knees are further um, further to the left, as in have less good clearance. Uh, so in general, the polycentric knees performed better, and in fact, KX06 was one of the best. Uh, taking that slightly further and uh, less abstract, so rather than just biomechanical measurements, uh, we actually look at um, falls that are recorded out in the community. Um, this is a very recent study, I think it was only last week it was published, um, where hanger clinics in the United States um, retrospectively looked at many of their 
uh, their patients that they gathered uh, outcome measures for, and in particular for different brands of uh, microprocessor knee, uh, to see if there were a different uh, difference between the, the, the models. Uh, and the most um, the most significant uh, outcome measure that they looked at was the prevalence of falls. Uh, and comparatively, there was uh, data they had for non-microprocessor knee users. So that's the, the knee in the image at the top there. Um, I think they were about 16% falls rate um, in terms of the prevalence over a six month period. Um, and Orion 3 was one of two um, of the microprocessor knee brands that showed a significant improvement compared to non-microprocessor knees. So that was that was a good result for Orion 3. Oops. Um, one of the uh, things that is unclear about that particular study is in fact what foot was being used with each of uh, with each of the knees, because obviously the the standing balance uh, study I discussed earlier um, changed well changed the knee settings, but also changed the feet uh, and showed that hydraulic ankles made a difference when combined uh, with with a microprocessor knee. Um, so this particular study here I'm showing is is one that was. Uh, presented at the uh, ISPO World Congress last year um, uh, by the team at Sheffield. Um, and this was a survey of 151 transfemoral patient, patients of which 29 were using the combination of Orion 3 and Echelon, so a, a hydraulic ankle. Um, there was a reduction uh, in the tripping rate, although this was uh, not significant. Um, maybe if there was uh, more around three echelon users that might have uh, eventually become significant. Um, but what was significant was the fact that there was a, a reduction in the likelihood of falling. Um, so those middle graphs you can see there, um, the falling rate among around three plus echelon uh, users um, was only around 10% and that's compared to 35% of mechanical knee users. Uh, finally, the bottom graphs uh, pie charts rather, um, show something quite interesting. These are just those people that reported a trip. Um, and then we looked at whether uh, they fell over as well. So whether they reported a trip and a fall. Uh, so of those people who looked at a trip, around three plus echelon users um, were significantly less likely to fall. So they, they had a falling rate of only 15% compared to 51% of mechanical knees users. So that was quite a substantial difference. Um, so that in and of itself uh, suggests that perhaps that stumble recovery that um, Laura was talking about earlier uh, does have a, a substantial effect. And then finally, this is uh, just something we've been working on in, in house and as yet is unpublished, um, but I thought I'd share it because it, it shows some interesting results. Um, this is a, a comparison of microprocessor feet versus non-microprocessor non feet. So uh, on the graphs, you can see the red is the non-microprocessor and the green is uh, Elan users. Um, they've also been divided up into the full cohort and then separately into transtibial and transfemoral uh, participants. And then the graphs from left to right show uh, the number of people that reported at least one trip um, in, in the period here is in the past four weeks. So we tried to base this around what is asked in the uh, prosthesis evaluation questionnaire. So that's why the, the time frame is shorter than perhaps has been reported in some of the other studies that I've already talked about. Um, so these are, that's from left to right, the uh, number of people that reported at least one trip. The middle is the number of people that reported multiple trips. And then on the right hand side is the number of people that reported at least one fall. Um, so the biggest thing, uh, I want to emphasize here is the falls because that is what actually causes the injury. Um, and overall, the reduction went from a rate of 21% with non microprocessor feet to only 7% with Elan users. Um, in particular, that fall was, uh, sorry, that difference was seen amongst uh, transfemoral users because uh, uh, no transtibial users actually reported uh, a fall. Um, in that specific four week period. But on, among transfemoral users, it reduced from 44 to 13%. So that, that again would make a, a drastic difference. Um, although no transfemoral users did report a fall, 
um, the rate of multiple trips amongst transceptive users dropped quite substantially from 46% to 29%. Um, so although in that particular period they didn't report a fall, um, this would suggest that if you've looked at them over a longer time frame, perhaps the fact that they were tripping less often uh, would eventually mean that they would report fewer falls as well. Um, but that's something that we'll continue to look at as we develop this work. So that's uh, as quickly as I could do, um, all the evidence uh, based around Blatchard products in relation to falling. If you want to read about this again or read any more, um, re read any more about what we've presented over this series of webinars, um, there are two white papers that I can recommend, one on the Avalon foot itself um, and one more broadly on hydraulic ankles and the evidence for those. Um, I think at this point we're passing back over to, um, to talk to Denise. Um, and get her experience with uh, with Blatchford uh, technology. Thank you, Mike. Um, hi, yeah, this is Denise. Um, I'm an above knee amputee. Um, my husband and I lost our legs 12 years ago in a road accident in America. I was a teacher. I'm 65 now, retired. I still volunteer. Well, pre-COVID, that is um, two days a week in a village school. Um, we've got a hundred year old cottage, bedrooms are upstairs, half an acre garden. Um, I do all the housework, I love gardening, and I'm in a classical choir, which will be important later on. Um, we're grandparents of a lively three year old, and uh, really I can tackle most things, there's little I cannot do. Now, as far as history of, of prosthetic use, um, we, we both started, I started on a mechanical knee, and um, that was a swing and stance medi knee and a fixed foot and I wore that for a few months um, I felt incredibly unstable I walked extremely cautiously very slowly I found gentle slopes extremely difficult adverse camber was virtually impossible and one thing I also found was the difficulty of stepping off a curb because the leg just sort of dangled it hung in the air and I had difficulty then landing on my heel. Uh, I had to take great care coming down steps or stairs. And I just noticed that I was always very anxious about falling. And um, I would always be looking at the terrain. Uh, a lot of mental effort as well. And I found it very tiring. And I would also just flop into a chair. Now, I did fall quite a lot with that um, leg. And the trouble is, as I think has been demonstrated, is that once you trip, really you're going to be on the floor. And uh, it was very quick. The leg just collapses. In uh, 2009, I went on an early version of, of the Orion. And I wore that for six years, uh, three in the, in the States and three in the Middle East. Now, this leg obviously had a lot more confidence in the knee. Um, I had very few falls. Um, but in 2016, um, when we came back to England, we tested the prototype of the Orion 3 and were given a hydraulic ankle, the Echelon BT. And I've had that now for four years. Um, if I try and do it in the same order as the other speakers, as far as balance goes, um, the standing mode on the Orion was um, amazing but took some getting used to. I mean now I wouldn't be without it. I mentioned choir. Uh, in choir in concerts as you can imagine we stand for long periods of time on a very narrow tiered stage and um, in school as well I stand for a lot of time just over the desks with the little ones and it's quite true I can be equally balanced which means I just relax. It's very good for my back but the thing I don't do is I don't keep making all these minor adjustments and favouring my good leg, which could lead to instability. Um, I really do trust the Orion 3. I can step over things. I mentioned before the sort of dangling effect of the mechanical leg, but um, with the Orion 3, I can actually step over things in the garden. That's really important to be able to step over plants and tree roots. In the classroom, it's a very confined space between the um, tables that the children work at. 
and you're stepping over cardigans, even marbles. Um, and I just find the knee consistent, which I think is really important for stability and for fear of falling. If, if, a, if a leg is consistent, you know how it's going to behave and it's very stable. Um, you talked about stumble recovery. I mean, I was amazed. I, I only had the, um, the Orion and the Echelon for a couple of weeks and I was out in the garden and I tripped on a tree root and I had both hands ready. Um, to brace the fall and uh, the knee just sensed the misstep, the resistance ramped up and I didn't fall. And I have actually fallen very few times in the years that I've been on an Orion. And if you do trip and fall, the other difference is it's a very controlled descent. Um, the supported sitting is very useful in the classroom, in just in the home um, because of the progressive yield feature. Um, I can actually sit on a chair without flopping, which again is much safer. And this um, knee resistance increasing as the knee flexes also helps me in the garden because I can actually descend to a kneeling position uh, more gracefully. But the combination of the hydraulic ankle and the Orion 3, um, was actually amazing for me. Um, it's a very natural feel to walking. The leg doesn't walk me, I'm very much in control. But my first experience when um, the prosthetist, Joe, put it on me at Blatchford Clinic was that instantly I walked faster. I mean, that was quite astonishing to both of us. And I had a much longer confident stride. And although we programmed it on single speed to start with, I was back and uh, we soon went up to multiple speed and I can remember actually coming in about a week later um, beam on my face saying you know I can actually beat the little green man on the pedestrian crossing um, because I can actually get across which is obviously very important for safety um, before the lights change. Um, the ankle and knee combination um, as far as falls and trips goes, I mean, it really helps. And I feel so much safer on uneven surfaces, particularly important for my gardening. Slight slopes, I don't notice now. Um, I always used to, uh, with a fixed foot, actually have trouble just walking down our driveway. I'd be very cautious. Um, but with the Orion and the Echelon, um, I can just walk down our drive. I can carry shopping back up our drive. And I just honestly don't notice the slope. There is also some slight help with camber as well. Um, so I'm really not so conscious of the terrain. I'm much more agile. And obviously this gives me more energy to walk further and to do the things I want to do. And um, obviously supporting a school class, I've been on field trips, on fruit picking on a farm with all the hazards thereof. And uh, we've also been on touring holidays abroad and uh, for instance I did like a two and a half hour sightseeing walk in Bergen which if you've ever been to Bergen has the most uneven cobbles ever and very sloped streets and um, when we went to Jordan I actually in a day walked 12 kilometers about seven miles and that was on sand rock um, pebbles and rough terrain and it was possible so I've actually with the um, hydraulic ankle and the Orion, I've actually moved from a K2 to a K3 user and uh, I can live an active life again. So I'm very grateful to, for these prosthetics. Thank you. Thanks, Denise, that's great. I think it, um, for me anyway, it always makes more of an impact when somebody who's using uh, the components talks about their experiences. Um, probably could have just done with Denise at the beginning going through it and then I could have kept out of it. But I just want to open the floor to any questions. Um, Kate's been manning the question front, so have there been any questions at all? Um, we just had a couple of questions about the KXL6. It might be worth flicking back up a couple of slides, back to those KXL6 slides if at all possible. 
Um, someone's asked, can you define high instantaneous centre of ro rotation a little more clearly? So we'll just wait till we get back to those slides. It might take a little while. <laughs> Uh, but basically, the instantaneous centre of rotation on a multi-bar linkage knee is determined when you bisect the linkages. So on a four-bar knee, a KX06, you bisect. Here you can see the two green lines bisecting either linkage. And what it shows is that the centre of the knee actually sits further down, but the linkages, the bisection of the cross, crosses of the linkages sits further up, meaning that the knee is inherently more stable. So the higher up that that section is, the green dot, the more safe the knee is geometrically. Hopefully that's answered the question. I don't know if anybody else wanted to add something there. Uh, if not, we've had one more question about for, again, with a KX06 user who goes boarding, um, sometimes you may need to kneel. What flexion angle can one achieve with the KX06? So Joe, do you want to answer that one? I don't know what it is. I haven't got that. I, I honestly don't know what it is. Kate? Me neither. That's why I asked you. <laughs> oh, Laura? I haven't, I haven't got a catalogue, Andy. Give me a minute. It's 160, isn't it? Oh, no. I'm just looking it up in the catalogue. Yeah. So you might think that we, 160 to go, you might think that these are figures that we have etched in our brains, but um, clearly we don't. So 160. Um, and there was a couple more questions I had for Denise, but it was perfectly intuitive that you answered them all for me, so that's me. All right, so if there's no more um, questions, I just want to say thanks to everyone who's helped with the presentations over the, the past um, few weeks. And for anyone who particularly wants to listen to them again, I think potentially with myself and with Mike, there might have been some internet issues so apologies if that was the case and if, if the sound quality went. But these will be available um, to listen to again, uh, if, if you so wish, as are all the other ones. If you go onto the Blatchford website, so blatchford.co.uk, and then go to the far right, there's a panel for professionals. And then you can just um, click on that and it should take you to a link where you can have a look at the um what we're trying to say have a look at the yes, there you go connect with us um which will take you specifically to the webinars so you can listen to any one of them uh, we are hoping to do some more in the new year um and then we can if anyone has anything in particular that you you might want to hear about that we haven't covered please do email me happily take any suggestions and yeah, thanks for listening. Hope that you have a good rest of the week. And obviously it's the motto of 2020, stay safe and um, try to stay healthy and we'll see you all very soon. All right, bye. It was 160. <laughs> I wouldn't go to catalog. And we just had one last question, getting just in time. What is the gate pattern for climbing stairs with MPK prostheses? Um, with our Orion, it's just a step to your gate at current. Who knows what will happen in the future? We're not setting. Yeah. I think what we have seen, and I don't know if Denise could comment, um, but I've certainly noticed people's gait going upstairs tends to improve with the hydraulic ankle. So it still doesn't allow for anything coming from the knee, but because, because the, the centre of mass the body centre of mass can be further over over the foot due to the dorsiflexion. Then people have reported to me that it's it's easier to go up. So with no change from the knee, just the difference that the foot makes. I don't know if Denise, do you have any? And to be honest, going upstairs, no, I haven't noticed much difference. I mean, it's just safe. I mean, you know, with or without the hydraulic.
Cool, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to go through my end end again, but if there aren't any, if there are any more questions, we'll give another second or two for that to come through. Um, otherwise, yeah, we'll we'll end the webinar.